It always happens when I'm in the middle of drinking. Welcome, everybody. Ginger Runner Live, episode number 104, back from the Pacific Northwest, back here to Los Angeles to the to the uh, really wonderful 90 plus degree temperatures. It's it's odd. El Nino did not happen this year. It's it's complete opposite of what we were expecting. Tonight's show, I'm very excited about it because the guest that I have on tonight is incredibly inspiring. This last year was, I can imagine, really tough for him, training-wise, uh, racing-wise, and it's all built up to a race that he recently ran. I don't want to spoil anything. The spoiler's already out there. You guys already know the results. My guest tonight is Sage Canada, and I cannot wait to talk to him, get him back on the show, and talk to him about all of last year's racing, running, training, leading up to a really recent incredible performance at Black Canyon 100K. We're going to talk all about what's happening this year with him, catch up with him. Excited to have him back on the show. So everyone, sit back, relax, and get ready for Ginger Runner Live. Ginger Runner. Yes. Welcome back, everybody. Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific. You know what time it is. It is time for Ginger Runner Live. Tonight's episode number 104 will feature uh, one of my favorite athletes in ultra running and running in general. He is one of the nicest dudes out there, uh, completely transparent. He puts all of his training out there. Uh, he, he has an incredible YouTube video or a YouTube channel as well where he posts videos all about his training and race recaps and stuff. He's just a blast. He's a really funny dude and also enjoys uh, the occasional beer. So let me introduce him back to the show. He's been on a number of times, but tonight I'm really excited because we get to talk about some fun stuff uh, that just occurred very, very recently. Welcome, Mr. Sage Canada. What's up, dude? How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, Ethan. Thanks for having me on the show again. I yeah. appreciate it. Fun and to so be back. <laughs> since the last time you were on the show, a lot has happened. Um, I, I kind of wanted to start the show tonight. Uh, well, first of all, for those live viewers who maybe are tuning in now, on my wrist is a Cinto Vertical. Uh, it's a new watch uh, out by Cinto. I'm still in the process of reviewing it, but tonight I will be giving away one of these watches. Uh, over the course of the weekend, we were holding a contest on Instagram, and there are nearly 200 entries, and tonight we are going to be announcing the grand prize winner uh, at the end of the show. But um, yeah, I wanted to talk to Sage first about last year, training for... Uh, the Olympic qualifiers, which also occurred a couple of weeks ago. Sage, you put in, how much of last year do you think you dedicated to your Olympic qualifier training? Because I know it was a lot. Yeah, um, well, you could say not enough and, and too much. <laughs> too much it felt <laughs> mentally. Uh, just running like on the pavement in Boulder when there are all these awesome trails to run in, in Boulder and Colorado and uh, around the world, but I, I kind of broke it up into, I also broke it up kind of a, a bad way. And I think that's part of the reason why I failed ultimately was because I started off early in the year running LA marathon and then the Boston marathon. And then I decided to go back to not just ultras, but mountain ultras like speed goat and UTMB. I also did comrades in between, which wasn't a good idea. No big deal. Uh, and then, yeah. and then try to shift gears and go back to the road stuff. And so that transition was, was hard and it was most of, most of 2015 I was running on the roads, I'd say, uh, the summer was all about the mountains and transitioning back. But of course I got injured at UTMB and, uh, I failed in, in making the Olympic trials qualifier time. Uh, but I think my first two marathons at LA and Boston were actually better than the ones I tried to do after UTMB for sure. You, uh, you hear about road runners, road racers, um, elite road men and women talking about training and ultimately executing one maybe major marathon in a year. Last year you ran, was it four road marathons plus comrades plus additional races? Yeah, Speed Goat and UTMB uh, and Kendall Mountain Run I did actually in the summer. But uh, yeah, and comrades is a road ultra. Um, yeah. If people don't know that, it's it's punishing. <laughs> the pavement hurts uh, after, well, any distance, but the, that's a tough race. Um, and I was, that was like four weeks or five weeks after Boston. So it was, it was a bad idea in retrospect. <laughs> uh, just to me, though, the dedication that it takes to, to, to run and race the distance and then continue to come back uh, when you don't meet a personal goal for you. Uh, why, like, 
how is it that the uh, Olympic qualifiers were just that important to you? Uh, where, like, what in your history or what is drawing you to the Olympic qualifier uh, that would d drive you to race four road marathons plus comrades and do all these other races throughout the year? I mean, that had to have been a huge driving factor to continue to do it. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it only happens once every four years. Uh, so there's that. Um, whereas most ultras, I love doing the ultra trail races, but a lot of them happen once a year. Olympic trials, it's only once every four years. So that makes it special. Uh, and then the fact that I, I had the streak going where I, I actually qualified for the Olympic trials marathon in 2007. Uh, I was the youngest guy at the, the trials. I was still in college, uh, 21 years old, did that one. I kind of felt lucky to qualify back then. The, the time was a little slower. So I was like, oh, I got this in. Then in 2012, I qualified uh, running a, as a post-collegiate uh, marathoner. Um, and so then I just figured I'd keep the streak going, or at least try to keep the streak going into 2016 and hopefully now 2020, maybe 2024. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't lower the standard. Uh, so it's it's kind of that, just that self goal, uh, just kind of the pride, I guess, of making it before and wanting to recreate that experience. Um, and it, it is a special race. Like for me, I know I'm not going to make the Olympic team in the marathon, the road marathon, uh, unless I could run like, you know, 212, 210. Uh, which probably isn't going to happen. <laughs> so for me, like just being at the Olympic trials race, the US Olympic trials race is like being at my Olympics. You know, a lot of people want to qualify for the Boston marathon or they want to, you know, qualify for a certain race. So it's like a, it's kind of like a dream race, I guess, so to speak mm -hmm. uh, on the road. So I kind of set that benchmark there and uh, I just went after it as hard as I could. And I ended up missing it by 12 seconds. And see, that's what, that's what's absolutely incredible, man, is just the the determination and dedication to uh, a personal goal like that and getting so close. There are great questions happening in the chat room, and I want to make sure that I get to those before I get to them. Uh, I was really curious what it was like for you. We had you on the show in the midst of it last year, but now that the, the whole year is kind of in, in perspective and the Olympic qualifier um, race was uh, two weeks ago in Los Angeles, now that that's passed, what was it like for Sage Canada in between these races, getting so close um, and not being not getting that time that you wanted in your head? Was it really difficult or was it like, I can't wait to get the next chance? What was the driving factor inside? Oh, it was a roller coaster of emotion. Uh, basically, just every time I failed, I, I was more determined to try again and I wanted to try again, but then I'd be mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't know if this race is going to be, if this course is going to be fast enough, or I don't know if the weather is going to be good on this day. I mean, you, you can never predict the weather. So uh, there's that. But yeah, I wanted to get after it as soon as possible. But at the same time, I really wanted to do UTMB in the summer. And so I knew I was going to break things up in the summer uh, with mountain running. And usually the fast marathons uh, in more mild weather, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, are in the spring and the fall. Uh, so I had that going for me. And I did have great weather conditions at uh, the last two marathons I did. So I, I really have no excuse. And I think the last two marathons I did, Houston and Cal International were actually probably the fastest courses that I did. But yeah. ironically, I ran the slower slower performances there. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was really determined, but I'd also be like devastated. And I'm still not happy about it, but it's in the past now. So yeah, I mean, I was going to uh, ask, it keeps the fire burning hot. Uh, and it kind of keeps me like always like trying to, you know, I want to qualify for the 2020 trials now. So that's like the next thing with road road stuff, but I could devote the next two years, at least the trails and mountains. So it's, it's really a win-win either way. You know, I'm really fortunate. So can't complain too much. Uh, the, the next question was going to be, are you going to go for 2020? I love hearing that you are, uh, dude, because this is super, this is super inspiring to me to, to watch someone like you, who's at a level that I can't even fathom first and foremost, and then to put so much time and dedication into trying to achieve a goal. Uh, it, it's, it's absolutely inspiring to watch, uh, you're not being able to achieve a goal the first time, trying it again, not doing it, trying it again and continuing to try it despite the fact that uh, it just wasn't happening leading up to that, like the fact you didn't give up and the fact that you kept trying is incredible, man, especially if someone uh, at your level and uh, we'll see you in 2020 for sure with a qualifying time. I don't think Sage Canada would let another four years go without 
putting in some secret training or something uh, and making sure that that happens. Super excited um, to talk about the transition into what happened the same day as the trials, but in another state and on other terrain entirely. Before we start talking about Black Canyon, we've got good questions coming up here. Uh, Isaac wants to know, Sage, when you do run, do you think more about the past or the future? Oh, gee, like in a race, I assume he's talking about a race. Yeah, I would assume a race, training. yeah. Okay, so yeah, my mindset in races is a bit different usually than training. Um, I think I try to think about the present <laughs> usually in a race because it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, you want to be present, but you also kind of want to zone out. So maybe I will think to like past experiences that might help me during the moment in a race. Like, oh, you know you felt this feeling before at mile 40 of 100k you know what to do or you know it, you could overcome uh some discomfort early in the race because you warm up after you get going for a while maybe you'll feel better uh so things like that i think in the past but I, yeah i was thinking i was thinking about my ma marathon failures uh that day when i was running black canyon i guess and i was thinking about uh a lot of people i know that were racing in the olympic trials marathon at the very same time uh basically I think, yeah, they, they started at 10 a.m. on the West Coast. So we were running during the same time, racing uh, in the heat during the same time. So I thought about that. But then I, I did think about trying to qualify for Western States or trying to just get to the next aid station and then get to the finish line and, uh, you know, how I was going to upload this run on Strava or something like that. So I do think about the future. Um, but usually I'm kind of just in the moment, I'd say. There's a good question uh, in the chat room. I'm going to kind of... Uh mix it up a little bit from Kima sub 75 asking Sage, you use the word failed quite a bit or a few times in your vlog as you were talking about Olympic qualifiers and stuff like that. Uh, he goes on to ask, have you fully gotten over that failure and will, uh, will you get over it and make it to the next Olympic trials? We kind of answered that second part, but I'm just really curious if you truly considered it a failure or a learning experience or how, how does that word apply? Oh, gosh, yeah, failure is pretty harsh, I guess, but I'm, I'm pretty hard on myself. I guess I'm always going to have a, a chip on my shoulder because <laughs> of the, the experience, but at the same time, it turned out being more, a lot more of a learning experience uh, than I thought, and now kind of in hindsight, it was a great learning experience, and maybe ultimately in the future, I'll look back in a couple more years and be like, Oh, that was a great idea to to you know go to Black Canyon and and then go into Western States and then throw yourself into mountain ultra trail racing instead of worrying about the Olympic trials and actually, um, yeah, because I, I do have the Olympic trials experience and you know mm -hmm. it's it's something that I'll be like oh you know I I missed it that year but it makes me more determined for the future and I think that's actually uh, it could be looked on as as an asset and a strength so. Kind of a little bit of both. Another great question from Pete. Uh, Chris Sock, Sage, you, in your recent vlog, you mentioned something about how you feel more at home in mutt or mountain ultra trail running uh, than in road running. Can you elaborate more on that and explain why you think so? Yeah, so this is probably a more, more recent experience, um, but it does kind of date back to when I started mountain running. Uh, like my first mountain race well my first ultra was chuck and nut back in 2012 and that was great i love the pacific northwest trails i grew up in the pacific northwest i was running with max king we both got lost i fell and got stitches i had the full experience uh i you know the human body's just naturally designed to run on soft surfaces uh for long distances and you know paint pavement is an artificially hard surface and so uh, it, you know, it's demanding to run road marathons. I love running road marathons, but mm -hmm. I think there is something about the trails that maybe all of us could experience that, you know, it's the peacefulness, the, the, the great views you get, views of nature, wildlife, uh, green trees, whatever, uh, that really kind of sets it apart. And when I was out there running Black Canyon, it did feel really natural. Whereas four weeks earlier, when I was running the Houston Marathon, I felt like I was trying to sprint and it was really uncomfortable and I really didn't like it. And I felt really slow and uncoordinated, but Black Canyon, I could relax and get in a groove. And I, I like uphills always. And when I'm grinding up a hill on a mountain or on a trail, uh, that does feel 
like something that's kind of like something that is my, you know, go to. And it's like, this is, this is what I meant to do. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I never got that feeling on the track. I was, the track was like, no. Uh, and I'm starting to feel like that way about the road. So yeah, that's, that's why I feel more natural on the trails, I guess. So I think this is a really good um, transition then into talking a bit about Black Canyon 100K. So uh, a couple of weekends ago, uh, you traveled to Arizona to partake in one of the golden ticket races. Um, there's a, a number of designated races, uh, 100K distance races, where the top two female and male runners get the golden ticket to Western states to participate at Western states at, at an elite level. Uh, did you have last year at all any desire to run black canyon was this something that you wanted to throw on your your list uh last minute was there something about not being able to run the olympic qualifiers that you were like damn it if i'm not going to do uh olympic qualifiers that day i'm going to do something big uh, what was the driving factor for signing up for this race uh i guess it dates back to my uh failure at utmb last year um i wanted to do a uh, really high profile, big stage, 100 mile race. Uh, well, I wanted to finish that. <laughs> and I wanted to do that at UTMB last summer. Mm -hmm. And since I didn't finish that, I was like, what race, what 100 mile race can I do in uh, 2016? And I was like, well, there's Western States, but you got to qualify for it. Uh, and that's, that's a hard thing. I mean, you look at those golden ticket races and it's the uh, two of them. Let's see, I guess it was the second one because Bandera was the first one. Then yep. Black Canyon 100K, Gorge Waterfalls 100K, then Lake Sonoma 50 uh, is is the fourth one. Uh, mm -hmm. O'Brien too. Is the most competitive, actually. Yeah, it's hard to be top two uh, at Lake Sonoma. You really have to bring your A game because uh, that's those. They're all competitive races, and you never know what's going to happen. So uh, Black Canyon wasn't on my radar because it was the same day as as the Olympic Trials. But right after Houston, basically, Houston was in January. I knew I, I, I missed the deadline like that. Houston was my last day to qualify for Olympic trials, right. which was four weeks later. I missed the time. And originally I was going to do like Sonoma as my backup or as my attempt to qualify for Western States. So that was always on the radar qualifying for Western States through golden ticket. Uh, but then since I wasn't doing the trials, all of a sudden I, I thought to myself, well, you could take a break now, call it a, a, a season. Then, you know, ramp up your training again. You know, I was, I was pretty tired after Houston. I'm beat up. I did calendar national six weeks before that. Uh, so that's two road marathons in the last month and a half. And I was like, well, maybe you could take this road fitness and transition it up to a runnable 100K. And I looked at, at the Black Canyon course. It doesn't have a crazy amount of climbing. It's actually a net downhill race. Um, and it's, it's fairly runnable. It actually kind of the technicality of the rocks surprised me in some sections and the heat surprised me, but it is a runnable race and it's not, I think it was about 5,000 feet of climbing total. Uh, so I was like, maybe you could kind of, you could get through it off of road marathon training. And so you might as well just go for it. Uh, Cause otherwise Lake Sonoma is going to be your only chance to qualify for Western States. And right. last time I ran Lake Sonoma, I wasn't in the top two. So uh, I was like, try to get a qualifier now and then you could take a break. So it's, it has a net downhill. Uh, it's not an elevation. You train at elevation. You're coming off of hardcore marathon training, road training. Was there any doubt in your mind at all uh, going into a trail race? Uh, did you have the confidence that the road training would transition um, into this sort of race environment? Uh, I always have doubt going into an ultra, especially. Uh, the main thing I was worried about, like I knew I had the speed and I knew I had trained my heart and lungs and even my, you know, fast twitch muscle fibers that are pretty high intensity. The problem was I had only done a handful of trail runs in the whole year. Right. And I, I actually, I always take like four or five days totally off after a marathon. Uh, and I tapered two weeks before the marathon. So if I, you looked at my last like six weeks of training going into Black Canyon, I think I averaged about 55 miles a week only. Uh, and so I'm averaging 55 miles a week, which is relatively low volume for me. Uh, I realize for a lot of people that might be high volume. Um, but you know, when you come from running a hundred miles a week, you're only running 55 miles a week and you have to do a 62 mile race. You're like, kind of like, Oh, I don't know <laughs> what's going to happen after mile, mile 25 or mile 30. Uh, right. I think the long, 
long run I'd, I'd done up to that point in training was, uh, well, I, I was like the Houston marathon. That was your long, your hard long run, 26.2 miles hard, uh, you know, two hours, 20 minutes. That was the longest run I had. Um, and I actually went to China for a little photo shoot project in between where I, I wasn't really running that much. I was just kind of hiking around in the snow in the mountains. And so I'm like, well, I'm not overtrained. I'm going to be really rested. Yeah. But I don't know if I have the endurance to, to pull through. Uh, so luckily I, I was, my legs didn't cramp up, but my legs did really hurt after I crossed the finish line. They were throbbing like crazy. And I've never experienced that. And I think it was because of the relatively low volume, um, that I had, I just hadn't run on the trails that much. Like I did one 20 mile, uh, training run in Boulder up and down the mountains about two weeks before the race, but that's all I had in terms of endurance. So I was just hoping that the speed would, uh, carry me through. Were you gunning specifically for a Western spot? Yeah, I was. Yeah, that was, that was the main goal, uh, to do the race. And it, it was a great event. It was really fun. Uh, well-organized race. I didn't get lost. I didn't fall and hurt myself. So <laughs> It was a success that way. <laughs> That's always a success. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you gotta do that. You can't, you gotta, you can't get lost. You can't fall and get stitches and <laughs> you don't want to do an epic bonk. If I could right. do those three things, like I, that's, that's going to be a good race. I think. So I kinda, it, walk us through a little bit of black Canyon hundred K. Cause, uh, did you feel like the field was stacked? Who was your competition? How did the beginning stages of this race work out for you? How did your body adapt over the course of the mileage? Kind of walk us through this day because it, it is an incredible performance. Yeah, so uh, it, it does get really hot there. And we started in the morning and it was pretty cool because it was like sun's coming up. It's like 7 a.m. in the Arizona desert. And we were actually at 4,000 feet. So there's a little elevation uh, it's quite a bit. It's it's like in the hills outside of Phoenix, so north of Phoenix, about like an hour and a half. Um, and yeah, I knew like some guys. There was a guy, Chris Mako, who ran at Cal International. He's a 222 marathoner, ran D1 at Stanford, had a lot of speed, but he didn't have a whole lot of ultra experience. So I was keeping my eye on him. I knew, uh, you know, 222 marathoner is probably going to be pretty tough to shake early on. Um, and then, yeah, there were tons of other guys. I think Ryan Kaiser, uh, who was sixth at the North Face uh, 50 mile in December, mm -hmm. he was uh, he led a lot of the, the way. And we did have a good pack going through like the first 12 miles. There were probably a dozen guys. So I was just trying to sit in the pack and just try to stay comfortable and be conservative. I wasn't going to go for a time. I was going for place. Uh, so I was conservative, but I was monitoring my splits. And I realized we were running a lot of like 640, 650 mile splits. And I knew that was, that was faster than I was going to be able to go in the second half. Oh, yeah. uh, it was more downhill in the first half though. So, and the weather was good. So I was like, well, we'll just roll with it. But then by mile 20, things kind of uh, thinned out. And I ended up taking the lead around mile 22. Uh, just because Ryan Kaiser was in an aid station a bit longer. And I, I was done in the aid station. So I just, I just kept going and, uh, Kind of just started opening up uh, a gap from there, but I was kind of anticipating the whole time uh, that something horrible would happen. My legs would cramp up, and I'd be doubled over in pain, and I'd totally bonk because I, I was a little worried about going that distance and coming from the mindset of running, you know, a road marathon and just thinking, "Oh, I just have to run a little over two hours." To all of a sudden thinking this is going to be an eight-hour race, uh, that was a little daunting, and. Uh, I, I guess I was just, you know, really lucky later on in the race. I had, uh, my girlfriend, Sandy crewing for me. She was doing a great job, really keeping things dialed, uh, making sure I was staying hydrated. Uh, cause it, the temperatures got up into the eighties probably. And I had been playing Jeez. in the snow in China and Boulder like the week before. And so like, it was, it was, it felt hot, but oh, I've I decided I'm a hot weather runner. I like the heat. Uh, so it wasn't that bad, but, um, we were, everyone was battling the heat and dehydration, uh, and the second half has some more climbs. So I, I really put in a pretty hard effort around mile 40. Um, and I think I only had like a seven or eight minute lead at that point, but I think I was able to open up on that climb, uh, and get some confidence up. I also had a really low point after that, but <laughs> <laughs> I always tell myself mentally, I've run 400 Ks before this, uh, and every hundred K I've run, at mile 40, I usually have this like horrible feeling where your legs hurt, everything hurts, you're, maybe you're nauseous, 
you feel like you're gonna bonk and you're like, oh, this is horrible, I'm not gonna make it. And you start thinking, I have 22 miles to go. And you're like, well, I'm two thirds of the way through the race. But then you're like, but I have 22 miles to go. Like, this is gonna take forever, <laughs> that's almost a marathon. And you get like, you always go to this really dark place. Uh, but in this race, I didn't have that feeling quite as bad as I have in other 100Ks like Tarawera or Bandera where I probably took it out too fast. Uh, so I, I got I derived confidence from that and was able to to finish without having any major cramps or without having to power hike even, which is a first for me in a trail ultra. Usually I'm reduced to power hike at some point. North right. Face 50, I was puking my guts out as I was hiking. Trans Alcania, Speed Goat, you're hiking up 30% grade, you're always power hiking. <laughs> Uh, usually I hit a rough patch, even Lake Sonoma, I, I've, I power hike every year at some point cause I just, you feel so bad. Uh, right. but I didn't quite get to that low in, at Black Canyon. So I, was, I felt good about it. And as far as nutrition, a lot of people in the chat room, chat room are wanting to know specifically, what did you do for nutrition this round? Yeah. So I was, uh, taking a V fuel gel every about 20 minutes. Actually, I waited the first 30 minutes, and then I was doing one about every 20, 25 minutes. And I was drinking, I had an 18-ounce handheld, Nathan Hydration handheld, mm -hmm. uh, sponsor plug, <laughs> um, full of noon, not a sponsor, but I, I had it full of noon, so one tablet of noon per 18 ounces. So I wanted to get some electrolytes in. Uh, and then I was doing that mostly, most of the race, basically. But then at some of the aid stations, I'd grab like part of a banana, too, because I was like, oh, it's good potassium source. I don't know. I like bananas now. Uh, so I'll, I'll grab maybe a couple of bananas. And then towards later on when it was getting really hot and I was really, you know, everyone was sweating, uh, you start craving some something salty kind of. So you go, you mix the sweets with a little salt. So I grab a couple of potato chips here and there. They had some pretzels at the aid station. So I, I just grab a couple bites basically just mm -hmm. to get in a little extra uh, sodium and another source of carbohydrate basically. So uh, I was picking at that. The one mistake I made was at mile 52, there's an aid station and Sandy was crewing for me and she handed me off my noon and water. And I was like, no, I want ginger ale, more ginger. Like I had bought this like ginger ale at Whole Foods the day before and I thought it would be the greatest thing because it would be sweet and it would calm my stomach. And she's like, are you sure you don't want more water? And Dave James is there and he's like, you know, you have a big climb coming up. It's going to be really hot. And I was like, no, fill up my bottle, bottle of ginger ale instead of water. <laughs> and so I, I leave with the ginger ale and Sandy's like shaking her head. And I start, it first it explodes into my face because we didn't even defizz it. Yeah. And then I realized it was like that really, really like super strong, gingery ginger ale. I kind of, it was too much ginger for me. You might, yeah. you might be okay with it. Not enough ginger, but this Never ginger ale was ginger. like, yeah, this Never ginger ale was, it was like naturally flavored, but it was like spicy almost, you know, like hot. And it wasn't, she had ice in my other like water bottles. This was like kind of more lukewarm temperature. Yeah. And by then it's like 80 degrees and I'm just sucking on this ginger ale on the last climb and I run out of it and I'm so thirsty for water. And I'm just like, dang it, I should have listened to Sandy and I should have just had water. Uh, but other than that, I th it was really dialed. Uh, and I was lucky that she was there to crew for me. It made things really efficient and I didn't I didn't have any epic bonks so basically yeah, as a lot of e-fuel and a little bit of salt I guess that got me through regardless of the uh, the ginger ale uh, debacle uh, you managed seven hours and 52 minutes and 26 seconds after starting Black Canyon's 100k to finish in course record time 50 minutes I believe it was 50 minutes faster than the second place mail uh, an, an incredible time, Sage, guaranteeing you a golden ticket to Western States 100. Um, at what point during this race did you feel like you had it on lock? And did that help you push harder? Were you even contemplating course record at this pace? Was there a point when you felt like, oh, I'm just going to click it into cruise control and just see if that takes me in for the win? Like what was kind of going through your head in, in that respect? Oh, gosh, you don't really have it on lock till you cross the finish line. <laughs> Um, and actually I didn't know what my lead was except for at mile 37, there's a little out and back. And I knew I had a seven or eight minute lead on that at mile 37. Uh, and, but there were two guys right there, uh, Ryan Kaiser and the, the guy who ended up, uh, finishing second. We're right together. Seven or eight Charlie, minutes behind me at mile Charlie 37. Yeah. 
So I was running scared uh, from that point on, and even at mile fifty-two, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how much of a lead I had. Like I'd look over my shoulder, but and I was like, well, you probably have at least five minutes, but you know, five minutes is nothing at the end of a hot hundred k. So I, I was looking over my shoulder in the last mile, actually. Uh, so I was running scared. I, I had no idea, um, but that 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 motivates you to get to the finish line as fast as possible. But at the same time, I didn't want to cramp up or fall and hurt myself and trip on a rock or something. So yeah, no more. Uh, no, no it, more was, it was a cars. hard effort. <laughs> it was there was no relaxing until I saw the finish line. Uh, so yeah, that I mean that helped with with the time, I guess. Charlie Ware. Uh, was the second place male 15 minutes behind also got great. a golden ticket, um, which is yeah, great performance. Is incredible. Yeah. He's a local guy, I think too. So yeah, Arizona, Arizona guy, uh, Amy Sproston and Denise Barasa also got the golden tickets on the female side with incredible races as well. Um, at any point during this race, maybe towards the latter miles of the race stage, did, did anything cross your mind, uh, in the sense of like, screw the Olympic qualifier race today. I just... <laughs> crushed black canyon 100k and i'm going to western states did that cross your mind at all just like super stoked to have such a great day it did a little bit yeah i'll admit to that after i crossed the finish line and after my legs stopped throbbing and i was i was like rolling around on this cot with pain <laughs> for like 20 minutes <laughs> yeah yeah usually usually like at speed goat and stuff i'm like sandy get a beer ready i want to be drinking a beer within 30 seconds after crossing that line this race, I was like, ah, maybe I should have some water first. And I was like, guys, I got to lay down on the cot. And I, I got my compression socks out. Or Sandy got them out of the car for me. Uh, thank you, Sandy. And uh, then I started feeling better. Then I had a beer and pizza. But before that, I was, I was not – I was happy. I was really happy, but I was in a lot of pain. Uh, but then, it, we, you know, we started looking up Olympic trials results for that day. And I heard it was a really hot day down there in L.A. And – a lot of the people I knew that ran the Olympic trials, um, I mean, it was it was a slow race for most of the the runners there, um, and a brutal race. Uh, just you know, they were battling the heat um, pretty bad, and so then I was like, well, maybe I, I don't feel so bad about being, you know, I, I felt better being out on the trails than out on the hot pavement, I guess, uh, in that regard. Of course, you know, I I was thinking about the Olympic trials, but it was like a sweet vindication, I guess, kind of, of, you know, it's a sign. I should go to do the hundred mile ultras this year. I love trail racing. Uh, it's, it's good to be back basically. Yeah. As, as a fan and as a spectator, that's all I was thinking too. Uh, we were spectating the Olympic trials and, uh, it was really amazing to see these incredible elite athletes perform out there in those really brutal conditions. Uh, even a lot of the race conditions that that were set up for the runners were not ideal. Uh, but it, just to hear the news that you had taken Black Canyon was like, dude, this guy deserves this. This guy deserves, after all the work you put in last year, Sage, to take that race and to be able to click your ticket and get to Western. Uh, looking forward to Western, we had the question in the chat room, uh, are you taking a break for a little bit before ramping up training? Are you right back into it? Uh, what's your plan of attack leading up towards, uh, towards States? Yeah. So right now I am on a, a planned break. Um, I mean, I always take like three or four days, five days off, totally off after an ultra. Uh, but I'm taking a longer break this time from running. I've been spinning a little on my bike. I have it hooked up to a little trainer inside our apartment here and I just, just real light stuff, like 30, 35 minutes a day uh, type of stuff. But this is a planned break, which I think is good. I, I call it my off season. It's not really my off season because I don't take, I don't ski. I don't do any other sport. Uh, and I don't take really long breaks, but I think it's good to like reset your endocrine system. Just totally chill out, drink some extra beer, gain, gain a couple pounds of fat uh, and just relax. Cause it's, I still have time to get a long buildup in. And what I want to do is do a long controlled buildup, uh, before Western States and really plan it out. Well, um, I am going to do Transvaal Kanya first though, as part oh, of that's, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. So that'll be my next race, uh, in May. It's, it's early May, I think May 8th, uh, always love going back there. And I think, mm -hmm. I think it's good heat training 
And I think it's just, it's such a hard race that it's, uh, I think it'll be good. Um, so it will be my next race, but yeah, I just, I'm going to take a break for another at least five days and then slowly just start building up and just trying to be consistent because it's always better to take a planned break than a forced break. So we say like, you don't want to get injured. You don't want to jack up your endocrine system. Uh, so you got to be patient right now. I'm itching to get out the door and start training again, but at the same time, I know I need to take at least 10 days, like totally off from running. So that's what I'm doing. Can we assume that Western is going to be your A race this year? So Transvolcania will be more of a, a stepping stone towards Western or vice versa? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> I, I actually, I don't, I treat all my races, I try to go as hard as I can in pretty much all my races. So I wouldn't say A or B race. Uh, they're all A races. And Transvolcania is so competitive. Uh, you have to bring your A game there if you want to place well. It will be part of the buildup, I guess, towards Western States. And I'd really like to do well at a new distance, at 100 miles, on a new course, uh, Western States. So, you know, I, I guess I'd... I might not taper quite as much before Transalkania as I will before Western States. Um, but I do like to do a race buildups in, in during the season. Uh, and no, I take, I'm taking Transalkania very seriously. That's awesome. Um, we had a question in here as well, and I can't believe it's taken this long for me to even remember it. What beers are we drinking tonight? Whenever we have say, John, we know it's <laughs> going to be something good. Uh, I'll start because this is, it's a gift from my, my mom. It was a birthday gift. Oh, she nice. got me a subscription to craft beer monthly where I get, uh, I think it's 12 craft beers delivered every month. <laughs> uh, they're, they're beers I've never actually heard of, but this one is HL Rex Session Pale Ale. And uh, it's from the Mono, Mono, Monocacy Brewing Company. I'm not quite sure. Oh, Maryland. It's it's decent. Sage, what are you drinking? I know it's got to be good. It's got to be an Avery. <laughs> uh, it is good. It's uh, it's the Avery Vanilla Bean Stout. And it's uh, it's one of Sandy's favorites, actually. she We went tasting there last week. And I know she likes Vanilla Bean Stout. Uh, it's about 10%, 10.8% alcohol. It's not bad. Perfect. Bourbon barrel aged. Uh, it's got like the real spice of vanilla in it. Um, nice heavy beer, you know, for stout month, February. Good winter beer. Um, I like all types of beers, but uh, I decided to mix it up with the, the vanilla bean stout from Avery Brewing. That sounds delicious. I was going to update you. Last time Sage was in town, uh, we all grabbed lunch at, a, at one of our favorite breweries locally, Golden Road, which is now owned by Anheuser-Busch. It has been bought out. Oh. And uh, so we got really wow. upset about that. I hope Avery yeah. does not fall, follow the same path. It seems like they're still very independent and still doing their own thing. They've got so much stuff on tap when you go there, like probably 30 different taps that are rotating. That's, That's great. crazy. Yeah, That's awesome. It's great. <laughs> we got Casey Lichtai in the chat room uh, saying that your advice for taking the break was the best advice ever. Oh, good to hear from Casey. Nice. <laughs> and we have uh, a lot of people asking, uh, have you put your crew together for Western States? And is the ginger invited? And you can answer whether it's this ginger or if it's ginger ale. Is ginger ale going to make an appearance again at Western? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to go with like Sprite <laughs> if I even go with any soda, soda pop. Uh, maybe not. It might depend on the weather. You're always invited, Ethan. You're okay, great. There, right? Yeah. You got to, you got to, yeah. I'm definitely. stamping my ticket. I'm stamping my ticket now. Uh, All right. It's not going to be a really golden like ticket. Hear. Yeah. No, uh, that would be good. Uh, got... I don't plan too much. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, yeah. What? So what other plans have you already put in place for Western? Uh, I know like my parents are going to come down from Oregon. They like to help crew and watch, uh, and Sandy will be there of course, uh, crewing and watching. Other than that, not, not too many plans. I think Sandy and I had talked about it. We want to go down sometime early, like take a road trip out to California and do some training on the course, uh, leading up to it, I think would be nice mm -hmm. to do. And a lot of fun. I've, I haven't even been to like, I've never been to that area actually. Um, I haven't been to Truckee or Auburn or even Lake Tahoe or anything like that. So we'd like to explore some of the trails around there and train, uh, hopefully heading into it. 
we got a good question from Jesse Luna, also in the chat room, asking, uh, are there any specific sections maybe you've read about or heard about, heard stories about that you are looking forward to training on or looking to train on for specific reasons? Oh, gosh, I don't know the course that well, to tell you the truth. I know it gets really hot in the canyons. Uh, so probably that second half of the race. Um, yeah, I, I like the sound of the start going up the first climb up uh, the hill there. Um, yeah, the, and the, I do know it's a net, it is a net downhill, but I think it's gradual. So hopefully uh, it'll, it'll be okay. I think it, it's actually probably kind of like Black Canyon. It'll be hot <laughs> and there'll be some downhill and smooth runnable stuff. Um, but it's a hundred miles. So yeah, I don't, it'll be an adventure into the unknown for me. And people also wanted to see the scar. How is the scar healing up from UTMB? Oh, the scar is not really very big. I don't even know if I could show you anything. It's probably all healed up now, huh? Oh, uh, let's see. Stand up. <laughs> These are not Hoka shorts. I'm not sure. Oh yeah. See. Yeah. That's, you can barely see it. Yeah. It was the, it was a very small, uh, stitch effort. Uh, the sti the bleeding and the, the actual cut wasn't what caused me to DNF. It was the fact that my knee was like twice as big and swollen and I couldn't bear weight. And I still had like 20,000 feet of vertical change left in the race that that's what caused me to DNF. Um, so no, I was lucky. I'm, I didn't get any serious complications from it yet. Mark Antoine in the chat room. Any tips for properly going from road to trails? Also, is it possible to properly train for trail when mostly have access to pavement? Yes, uh, to both those, I guess. Uh, yes to the second part. The first part, what I found is it doesn't, the actual distance of a trail mountain race doesn't matter as much as the vertical profile, I always think. So like, you could be running the speed goat 50K and it's super mountainous and you're, you got tons of vertical, but it takes you just as long as the JFK 50 mile, which has some climbing, but it's, it's mostly pretty runnable and relatively flat for a, a trail ultra race. So it's not so much the, the distance 50 K versus 50 miles. It's how steep are the Hills? How mountainous is the terrain? How technical is the terrain? What are the weather conditions? Uh, so it, it depends on what course you're training for the course profile. And, you know, if you're, tied up in pavement or you've got to improvise and do stuff. Uh, we have Sandy and I coach a lot of athletes. We have them do treadmill workouts a lot of times. Um, if they have access to a treadmill or if they're traveling a lot, treadmill on inclines is, is a good friend to get in vertical. If you don't have mountains, uh, doing hill reps on, maybe you have a paved neighborhood and you have a, a hill or a, a bridge or something that you could do hill repeats on to get in vertical that's a good way to simulate the climbing that you experience in trail. Now, technical trail, that's, that's a little bit harder to, to train for. Um, you could do some stair running maybe, uh, but that's, that's kind of a learned skill, but just getting in the vertical, I think is, is more important and training the heart and lungs, getting, you know, the, the, the time spent building your aerobic base, uh, pays really dividends when you transition up to, to longer distances. And, uh, like I've always said with the, the marathon training, uh, you could bounce up to 50 K and make that transition by just extending some of your long runs basically and, mm -hmm. and trying to get in, you know, once a week on the trails would be good. But, uh, part of it's building strength through doing hill training. Another great question, um, regarding your diet, your everyday diet. Uh, this one comes from Spencer it wants to know, uh, lately you've been eating more of a plant-based diet. I know that you were vegetarian normally, but this time without cheese, have you noticed any difference with recovery since the change? Um, that's hard to say. Uh, I think I'd like to think it's helping. <laughs> I don't know how much of it is like a placebo effect. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll be brutally honest. I'm not, I want to try to be like a hundred percent vegan, but sometimes I cheat. <laughs> like if it's really inconvenient for me or like, you know, say I travel to Chamonix, France again, and they're trying fondue or raclette. I'm going to try fondue and raclette. <laughs> Uh, cause I, I love cheese, but for the most part, I, I do avoid it now and we're, we're most, mostly plant-based. Um, and I think, you know, my recovery, uh, knock on wood somewhere, <laughs> I've always been pretty fortunate not to have a, a serious overuse injury and to be able to bounce back relatively quickly after road marathons or even 
ultras. Um, and I, I would, I mean, some of it's, you could say is genetic. Some of it could be running form. Some of it could be taking planned breaks and running, but I like to attribute a lot of that ability to, to a, a diet high in antioxidants, which a lot of plants are, and just trying to like not eat, you know, a ton of, of grease or, uh, just, you know, extra things that I, I probably don't need. That being said, I, like I love ice cream, but here in Boulder, it's easy because you have uh, vegan gelato at the local gelato shop. You have vegan cheese alternatives, uh, so it's you know it's it's pretty easy here in Boulder. Um, and I you know it's Sandy's really good about it. She eats a lot healthier than I do, uh, so we kind of cook together, and I get the benefits from it. It's the same in this household too. Kim is incredibly healthy and uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to eat healthy thanks to her. Um, a great question from Adam. Uh, this is Adam Baldwin. Are you going to seek any mentor for Western states? Based on comments from Krar and Andy Jones Wilkins, course knowledge is super important. Do you look at Western as just another race? I like the mentor question. Are you going to maybe look at possibly getting a mentor? Oh, that's a good idea. Um... Yeah, I'd, I'd probably look into it. Um, I could, uh, could ask Rob a couple of questions. That would definitely <laughs> be helpful. Um, or, you know, anyone who's run the course or knows the area, you know, <laughs> give me information. <laughs> I'm all ears. <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, and I think training on it and visualizing it uh, hopefully will help. Ironically, usually when I do the most course recon and I go and train there early, I usually end up having a horrible race. But uh, <laughs> I think, I mean, it's just, they're just really historic trails. There's a lot of history there and it's a yeah. really special event in, in us ultra running and, and just, yeah, the history there is amazing. So it's not just any race, uh, of course, to me, it is like, uh, you know, one of the ultimates you could say, if not the ultimate, um, for me, I guess I think of it in terms of this is going to be hopefully my first hundred mile finish. Uh, so I think of it that way and then I'm think, you know, it's going to be super competitive. And then I think, wow, this is really cool to, to be a part of. And, you know, the history here is amazing. Uh, everything that's happened on this course over the years and just the story of it, I think, uh, makes it a really special event. So, uh, treat it with respect, respect the distance, respect the history and, uh, respect all the runners that have gone before you on it. Uh, speaking of runners that have run on it before, Casey Lichtai is asking if you will join up with the training camps, the Western States training camps that they do. I don't know yet. Uh, let's see. It's, it depends on my calendar. I, it's, yeah. it's up in the air. Um, we might go a little earlier than that. I think it's usually Memorial Day weekend. I might be wrong on that, but yeah, three day weekend. Uh, yeah. yeah, we might have something else going on. I, I haven't, I need to double check my calendar. It's a possibility, I guess. It'd be cool. It'd be fun to meet up with a lot of people. Mark Antoine, uh, favorite distance, 50K, 100K, 100 miles? Oh, well, I, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, gosh, you really can't just pick one. I, I can't say 100 miles because I've never finished 100 miles, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I'd like to think I could be, I could be good at 100 miles, but, uh, you know, favorite course is probably Speed Goat because it caters to – my strengths the most probably and because it's great views high altitude burn uphill climbs uh so i like all that um i mean i really like the 50 mile distance too again though it's it, it the course profile i think is what changes things for me and you know you run like trans Volcania is a great race and it's like 44 miles or like 45 it's some arbitrary distance kind of 83 kilometers um I'm not doing the math right on that, but you know, it's it, the profile is what makes that race. The the tour of the island, running from from sea level to the top of a volcano at eight thousand feet, through five different types of environments and climates. That's kind of the special thing about a race for me. So, yeah, you know, if I had to pick a favorite race, I guess Speed but Speed Goat Fifty K is probably my favorite all time race. But that's just because it it caters to my strengths the best. I think. Right. Do you have any plans to go back to UTMB? I do. I really want to do UTMB. Um, the thing is, this year, I wasn't technically qualified for it. Um, I might be after I do Western States. I haven't even looked at the points uh, on, on how that works. But since they changed the point system with UTMB, 
since I didn't finish last year, I wasn't technically qualified to enter again in uh, 2016. So what I did was I entered CCC uh, instead. So I am signed up for CCC. Uh, so yeah, I love Chamonix. I, I love to go back. I'd love to do UTMB for sure and try to finish. That would be great. You've always been uh, really outspoken and candid about your opinions on uh, drug testing and making sure that athletes are tested and, and that it is a clean sport. You've always been an advocate for clean sport. Uh, with recent developments in the ultra and in trail world, uh, do you have any opinions on on those that maybe want to run Western that uh, have previous uh, drug uh, uh, they've been not accused because it's already they're guilty of using uh, it's, uh, enhancements in the past participating in, in events like Western States and dovetailing with uh, Chris Barnacle who recently ran the Olympic qualifiers but is also a known uh, distributor of marijuana and other uh, drugs like that do you have any opinions on either of those matters oh Oh, I got opinions, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a slippery slope, you know, like there's, I know just from some online stuff, like it's, it's a passionate debate. Uh, you could call it a debate, I guess. Um, people are passionate, you know, on different sides and there's a whole spectrum kind of, of in between. And I think just coming from like the road and track background, uh, there's kind of like a different mindset. And I think what we've seen, uh, Gosh, it's, it's a difficult thing to say. Uh, like certain races and certain governing bodies in the sport have set certain rules for certain substances. Uh, but then, you know, there's kind of this gray area. For example, like the Nike Oregon project with TUEs uh, is a therapeutic use exemption. Um, it's kind of a mouthful there. Yeah. Um, where it's like, you know, if you have let's say you have asthma, you could take an inhaler, um, uh, but there's different types of inhalers. And so then they categorize it into, you know, albuterol is one thing, you don't need a doctor's note for albuterol. Right. Uh, but then there's corticosteroid inhalers, which are most of the heavy duty asthma inhalers. Uh, whereas if you have a doctor's note that says, oh, you actually have asthma, you get asthma attacks, then it's okay for you to use an inhaler. Whereas if you didn't have asthma and you're using this really heavy, you know, hitting inhaler as like a stimulant, which I think is probably more ap applicable to shorter distance events, mm -hmm. uh, then it's, you know, not okay. And so there, it's a slippery slope. Um, and, you know, let's say marijuana use during ultras. Um, those don't bother me as much. It's technically against the rules. Um, and, I, you know, I don't smoke. I, I don't, but I don't mind people that do. In Boulder, it's legal. <laughs> not in competition. Um, right. but that, you know, those are examples of smaller things. Now, when you get into performance enhancing drugs on a larger scale, uh, things like EPO, I think is probably the most dangerous, uh, used in traditionally all endurance athletics. That is a major, major advantage. You know, that's not to be compared to, uh, you know, someone helping pace you during a race or someone crewing for you. Um, I think like that you're talking I don't know the numbers on it, but I guess I've raced guys on the road that have been busted for EPO and right. it's like they're floating along and you're just like, how is this guy beating me as horrible form? He's, you know, not looking good and he's just throttling me. And then later they're like, yeah, he was on EPO and you know, he'll admit to it. And he's like, yeah, yeah I finally felt like I was one of those featherweight Kenyans just floating along at 450 mile pace. <laughs> and, uh, when you think of it like that, you're like, you're probably looking at, I don't know, this is a guess, this is my opinion, three to 5% type of increase in performance, which is huge at the, mm -hmm. at a high end level. Um, and not just that, but your ability to recover between races. And uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm for a clean sport. There's a good website out there, uh, Run Clean, Get Dirty, I think it's called. It was started by one of the uh, guys that helps organize, organize the Mount Washington road race. Um, Paul Kirsch and then all the athletes on there um, like you could you could go to the website and see all the athletes that signed the petition it's open to anyone anyone could sign it and it's just saying hey I want to help pledge to keep the sport clean I won't take any performance enhancing drugs um, if I do then I'm basically going to retire from the sport um, but 
you know, the great thing about the ultra running community and the running community as a whole is that it, it has been really inclusive and open to, you know, diversity. And I know there's a lot of people, especially probably in the ultra trail running community, at least, you know, from stories I've heard that maybe have struggled with some sort of drug addiction in the past, um, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, alcohol or some other heavy hitting drug, maybe some drug that's on the banned list technically. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a time in their life when they were in a dark period in their life. It's a time in their life maybe when they weren't even running at all. And, you know, they're not maybe a sponsored runner or looking to make money in the sport, of course. Uh, so I think, you know, those people, they overcome that kind of, you know, challenge in life and they, they find running, you know, as a way to, to sober up or a way to, you know, explore a new outlet. And, you know, of course those people are, are always welcome and, and shouldn't be banned. It's other people that kind of have systematically abused maybe EPO or some really heavy hitting PED for years and years on end to really gain a competitive advantage. Those are the kind of people that I'm a little more leery about. And I realized I'm biased because, you know, being a, a pro mountain ultra trail runner and relying on sponsorship, uh, relying on race performance as a major source of income, right? Uh, it probably grinds my gears a lot more when someone on EPO might beat me and cheat me out of a payday uh, versus, you know, the vast majority of runners who, you know, it's nice to win an age group um, award and like, Sandy and I coach a lot of people that work really, really hard to win an age group award clean. And, you know, I'm thinking of those people too, but like I realize most people don't aren't financially tied up in the sport at, at the same level. Uh, so maybe, you know, the, the opinion is going to be different, different on that. Um, but yeah, it's a slippery slope. It's, it's tricky because you do want to welcome in everyone in the sport and you, it's hard to like look at all the, you know, the guidelines out there by all the, different, you know, WADA, USA, USDA, um, and make really clear cut, uh, rules with substances and penalty duration and things like that. So I probably ran it way too long on that, but no, man, it is, it's, it is it's, something I'm passionate about and yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's always good to talk to you about stuff like that. Cause I know that you're Frank and you're honest. Um, there's definitely a, a wall with a lot of elite athletes too, about, they don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to offend too many people or any of that kind of stuff. And the reality is people uh, at the elite level need to be honest and open about their opinions on these things because it matters. And as our short, as our sport is continuing to become more popular and more athletes from other major sports that have more uh, popularity and publicity are joining the ranks of ultra runners and, and mountain, tra mountain ultra trail races, uh, it just needs to be talked about hundred percent. So thank you for your honesty and your frankness. Uh, I'm, I want to make sure that I, I promote and talk about you as a coach as well. You and Sandy have a website, VO2 max productions, I believe is where people can go to get all of the packets, right? Correct actually, me if I'm wrong on all that stuff. No, actually, uh, we updated it. Sagerunning.com. Sagerunning.com. Resource. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the old website, <laughs> the old one. Okay. Let's go to uh, the sage running then, uh, com. Tell us a little bit about kind of the, the package deals that you're offering and what levels of athletes you're looking to bring in and, and stuff like that. Um, so right now we're actually full with our monthly coaching. Uh, there's like a wait list for individualized monthly coaching, but what we do offer is, uh, training plans that we've created, uh, from half marathon to hundred miles. And you could look at those training plans. You get an instant download. It comes with our pace intensity spectrum chart. It comes with the training guidelines, uh, and they're usually you know twelve to six, sixteen week plans uh, to kind of get you through a fifty k or fifty mile. And there's like a intermediate plan, advanced plan, uh, different ones in there, um, and then as well as our ebook that we sell, the the Sage Running Secret, a guide to speedy ultras. Uh, you could download that directly too from the website. Nice. Uh, I highly encourage people to go check it out. Obviously, <coughs> Sage and Sandy are both pretty damn awesome runners. Um, Sage coming off an incredible win at Black Canyon, 752.26. Can't even fathom running that sort of speed for 62 miles uh, in that kind of heat. Just nuts. New course record there. And uh, there was, this question was asked a number of times, so I want to make sure that we ask it before we move into the giving away of a watch uh, and then into the post show real quick with Sage. But where are good trails or what is your favorite trail to run in Boulder? 
Oh, favorite trail. Uh, it's got to be Bear Peak, uh, Westridge route. So there's two like major peaks in Boulder where the flat irons kind of press up against. And the more popular one's probably Green Mountain. But then right next to it is Bear Peak. And it's a little higher. It's a little steeper at the top. But Bear Peak is my favorite peak. And there's a trail that goes up between Green and Bear, actually, along the West Ridge. And it's you get beautiful views of, of the, the bigger mountains way off in the distance off to the west. Uh, you kind of snake up through this old burn area, and then you could see the top of Bear. It's a longer, more gradual approach. Mm -hmm. uh, it still gets really steep at the top, but that's hands down my favorite trail. Uh, going up Bear Canyon there, it's where I saw a mountain lion once. Uh, it's just, it's a fun trail. Uh, so if I had to pick one trail in Boulder, they're all pretty amazing. Uh, it would be that one. Go. People who have been asking that question uh, in the chat room, go check it out. Uh, I have yet to go up Bear Peak, but I've heard incredible things about it. And and seeing Sage's pictures and all the uh, the runners out of Boulder's pictures from the top of Bear Peak are like, yeah, that looks pretty damn awesome. Uh, before we let Sage go, or before we move into the post show with Sage, uh, Sage, where can people find you online? Where can people find or follow you, ask you questions, anything that maybe they, they like any questions or things they want to talk to you about uh, after the show, where can they find you? Uh, let's see, on Instagram and Twitter, at Sage Canada, there's my name there. And then I have a Facebook athlete page, um, but don't send me questions on that. I, uh, <laughs> I got behind on my messages. Um, but if you do want to send me a training message, you can do it on my Patreon channel, uh, Patreon slash Sage Running. Uh, support my YouTube channel, uh, VO2Max Productions as well. Uh, that would be the best way to contact me. But uh, other than that, yeah. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Do it up. You guys know the drill. Uh, go support the man, incredible athlete, going to be doing some pretty awesome stuff this year. Can't wait to follow up, Sage, post-Western, uh, or maybe even see you there. And if you if you need a Ginger crew member or a Ginger and uh, a Kim uh, Maya Long Legs crew member, you just let us know. We'll be there in a heartbeat. Um, That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, man. It's it's time for a giveaway. I do these every so often, and tonight's is huge. This watch is, is awesome. I'm still in the midst of reviewing it. It's a Cinto Vertical. It's their new, uh, new uh, running watch, outdoor mountain adventure watch. Gets you good altitude readings and all sorts of good stuff like that. It's super light. Fits on the wrist really nicely. They did away with the little extra antenna doodad from the, uh, the Peak 3, uh, Ambit 3 Peak. So basically what I did over the last few days was had you guys submit your photos on Instagram. I have chosen one at random out of the 156 entries that came in before the end of the time. That's also excluding my entry because I accidentally used the hashtag realizing I had to enter the contest myself. Uh, so out of the 156 entries, uh, one was randomly chosen as the winner. If you are watching tonight, please drop me an email at thegingerrunner at gmail and we'll make sure that we get the watch out to you ASAP. If you are watching this within 24 hours, maybe you're not watching live, but you're watching tomorrow or Tuesday. Uh, still, just drop drop me the email, and I'll try to get in touch with you as well on Instagram. I had a number of favorites. Some of these photos were incredible. You guys got out this weekend and got up. It was really, really awesome to see some of these photos. I'm just going to show a couple of them very, very briefly. And because of this website, uh, YouTube not really allowing the format to be quite right, they're going to be a little screwy as far as formatting. But this is from Alejandro Solomon 01. Got up a 14-er, 14,000 feet with his uh, Solomon kicks. It looks like he's actually wearing pants, too. So he, he, he managed to get up there without actually wearing running gear. So that, I admire that. Uh, a great shot here from Todd Wiggins. Uh, looks like he went running with Santa Claus. So that's pretty cool. Uh, right there in the middle. But a uh, really cool crew. Looks like some of them were racing. Way to get done. Love this shot from Scott, because uh, he's also wearing a ginger runner wrap, which I, I have to appreciate. And that's one of the coolest things is running into runners uh, with the wraps, which actually happened this weekend in Oregon up on Angel's Rest Trail in the gorge. We were three miles up the trail and some guys like powering up wearing just shorts and like a light shirt. And we were all like, this guy's completely underdressed. Do we need to keep our eye on him, make sure everything is Good. It was freezing and raining and it was, you know, he was inappropriately dressed for the weather, but he was power hiking super fast and he comes up and he's wearing a ginger runner wrap. And he's like, what? Like freaking out that, uh, that we were there together, both wearing our wraps. It was really, really neat. So shout out to that guy. He was totally fine. He didn't have to worry about him. Really great shot here from 
I'm guessing Zhao Zhao Faria. I'm going to mispronounce it, but beautiful photograph here up in the peaks, running through some snow. And the next photo is your winner tonight, chosen at random, uh, thanks to uh, random integers, uh, chosen uh, on the website where you can choose random numbers. And all the photos in this contest were assigned random numbers. Your winner tonight, Alyssa Kid Project. This is photo from Waterholes Canyon. Uh, really, really beautiful shot. I need to know where this is. I need to know how to get there and I need to know how to run in that because that is absolutely stunning. So congratulations, Alyssa. You are the winner of the brand new Cinto Vertical. So drop me an email if you're watching now or later and we'll make sure that we get that out to you ASAP. And I hope to do many more giveaways just like this. So if you guys enter it and are like, oh, I didn't win, there'll be more stuff, I promise, because it's super fun to do stuff like this and the photos were phenomenal. So once again, make sure you guys go follow Sage at Sage Canada on Twitter. Go to his Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash uh, what, Sage Running. So make sure you go to, to his Patreon page and support him there. Uh, those of you who follow me and support on Patreon, it's uh, it's go do it for Sage. It's incredible what he's doing, both as an elite runner, uh, being completely open with all of his training on his Strava, plus making videos and doing vlogs and all sorts of athlete updates and stuff on his YouTube channel. So it's it's definitely for a good cause. That is it for tonight's show. Stick around for the post show. We'll do some quick rapid fire questions with Sage before we let him go to finish off his 10.4% beer. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. Uh, so stick around for the post show, guys. We have many more questions to, uh, to deliver to Sage. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys next Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific for more Ginger Runner Live. <laughs> Ginger Runner. Awesome. Cool. So, Sage, you know the drill. We're in the post show. Uh, there was a number of questions that I didn't get to ask. I was too busy spitting. I spit there at the end of the show. <laughs> I don't know Keep what them happened. coming. Keep the questions coming. <laughs> Keep the questions coming. Uh, okay. So, let me just pull it up here. Kim had pulled some, too, from the chat room. Uh, a good question from Kimo Sabe. I don't know if we ever asked you this on previous episodes, or maybe this list has changed. Bucket list races. Any bucket oh, list races for you? Gosh, it's probably races I don't even know about. <laughs> I know, like, I'd love to travel to, to Patagonia. Um, I'd love to travel to New Zealand again. I've, I've been really lucky, and I've gotten to run a lot of my bucket list races over the years, and I just want to go back to them. <laughs> um, I mean, 100 miles, like Western States is a bucket list bucket list race so uh that'll be another one if i could finish it <laughs> utmb still bucket list race because i didn't finish it i guess um there's probably races i don't even know about that i want to do though uh all over the world all over the u.s uh there's you know a lot of great local races um just running like the grand canyon rim to rim to rim again that's bucket list running zion you know fkt routes too uh I don't know. I said enough. <laughs> <laughs> it, they're just the list you made there. I'm like, oh yeah, gotta add that to the list. Oh yeah, <laughs> gotta make sure I add that. Uh, the list is ever expanding for sure. Good question here uh, regarding. Let's see, we had the revet. Where did it go? I just missed it. Uh, oh yeah, Hoka. What are your favorite Hoka shoes right now? And uh, do you have any maybe that are coming out that you're looking forward to, or maybe prototypes that you're running in? Anything like that you can talk about? Yeah, so uh, we're going to launch the, the Clayton pretty soon. The Clayton and Tracer, which are technically road racing flats. They're both super light, though, uh, and they're a lot different. And I actually raced uh, Houston, the Houston Marathon, in the Tracer, and it's like a seven-ounce road racing flat. The Clayton is also a road racing shoe, although you could use these on, you know, tame trails, buffed-out mm -hmm. trails. You know, they're not designed to, to have traction, but if it's dry dirt, why not? Um, the Clayton is a lot wider and it's a lot more flexible in the forefoot. And so I think it gives people a lot of options, but it's also like seven ounces, seven point something ounces. And it's got a little bit more stability to it compared to the tracer, but they, they both just feel super fast. Uh, so those are great. Uh, my go-to heavy duty trail shoes, definitely still the speed goat, uh, just cause of the Vibra mount sole, the traction on it, it's really amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's all the, the Challenger Two is coming out, um, or it's already out. I don't have one, but I've heard good things. 
Yeah, it, it would be good. I've been running in that one. Oh, I thought I had my pair right around here, but yeah, they're. I think they're out now. I think the child. Oh, good, are good. Out now, yeah. yeah, Clifton three. Um, yeah, all the, all sorts of new innovations coming out from Hoka. So stay tuned to Ethan's channel for great reviews <laughs> on those. Right, Ethan? <laughs> yeah, I, I try to stay up to date with all the Hoka stuff because I'm. Uh, I've always been such a fan. The Clifton one and the Challenger ones are still. If I can find those anywhere online, I buy them by bulk because they're still <laughs> some of my favorite shoes ever. I'm really excited about the Clayton because you're not the first person to mention it's a wider forefoot, which I've just been like, I want that. I want that wider forefoot, but uh, a still good fitting shoe, right? And I think the Clayton's going to be, I haven't tried it, but I'm really excited because multiple people have said it's awesome, including it yourself. Is. Yeah, very flexible upper too. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. This is a great question from Rick. Is Sadie planning on running any more races in the future? Or sorry, Sandy. I read, read yeah. Um, oh, of course. No, she's got big plans. Uh, and she, well, she had Achilles tendon surgery last year. So she's been trying to overcome that and just, you know, get through the winter and get back to consistent training, which uh, she's starting to do now, finally. It takes a while. Achilles tendon surgery is not what you... It's not a quick one to come back from. So she's been really smart and patient with it now. And she definitely wants uh, to really take the, the mountain trail running scene by storm and do the big races. Um, she's not fully committed on, but I think, um, yeah, look for her name and results definitely coming this, this summer, I'd say. So she's back That's to awesome. running. Yeah, she's yeah, in mountain trails now. So I was going to ask if it's difficult for Sandy to, to crew – and not be out there racing because i know there was a time when you guys would both race the same race or different distances at the same venue and you would win and then you'd be there and she would win and it would be pretty pretty awesome so i bet she's just chomping at the bit yeah i'd, I'd be happy to crew for her <laughs> so look forward to, to switch it up we talked about challenger twos this is kim's pair of challenger twos that we just took up to oregon and it was nice. super sloppy mud and these things still, like, she was bombing the downhills through, like, what'd you say, Kim? These are brand new, as in, that was her second <laughs> run in them, and they are absolutely muddy. Yeah, babe, you need to wash these. <laughs> they nice. smell pretty bad. <laughs> but not her feet, just just because of the mud. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to scroll back down here to the questions. Uh, what's your preferred method of hill training? Ooh. Um... I guess uh, my favorite hill workout is to do, uh, we call it a, either an up-tempo or tempo run, just a steady, straight climb for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Uh, that's always my favorite. We do have our athletes, uh, and I do sometimes, a lot of hill repeat workouts where they're shorter, but there's always a different stimulus depending on you know the duration of how much recovery you have, what intensity you're running them at how steep the hill is. Uh, but my go-to is definitely the uphill tempo run and you can do it on a treadmill. Uh, I did, I've done a lot of workouts on a treadmill on incline. Uh, but here in Boulder, I'm lucky because we have roads like Flagstaff road or Magnolia road where you could just run four or five miles straight up a hill and gain two or 3000 feet and just keep running. Cause it's a road, uh, or a trail you run up green or bear pretty steady. Um, and you know, monitor the heart rate, uh, most of the time. So it's my favorite. Do you do multiple speed trains, uh, training in a week or uh, different types of runs, or do you try to limit it to one, maybe one and a half or two? Uh, it's, it's pretty limited. Like usually, gosh, I haven't been mar or ultra trail running for so long training for so long. Uh, usually I do on average, I don't always operate on a seven day cycle, so to speak. So, I'll end up doing a long run maybe once every eight to 10 days and I'll end up doing maybe an uh, uphill tempo and then some sort of other speed work also in that eight to 10 day cycle. So sometimes it's, it's two quality workouts a week, uh, I guess on average most of the time, but long runs are considered quality workouts, hard workouts. So uh, I kind of mix that in. It depends on the type of long run. Good question here from Pete. I was actually curious about this well as well because I was looking at this race, the Cayuga Trails race in Ithaca. I know you went to Cornell. 
Uh, I've been looking at Cayuga just because it looks gorgeous. That race looks incredibly gorgeous. Have you ever thought about going back there and racing? Ithaca is gorgeous. That's that's a joke, actually. Um, and you won't get it until you've been there. Like they have T-shirts that say that because it's there's all these gorges, like right. you know, the gorge with waterfalls, but then it's it's also pretty, so it's gorgeous. But um, no, it's it's a great event. Uh, Ian Golden is the race director, and I actually worked in his running store uh when i was in college he has he owns finger lakes running company down there in ithaca and sells trail shoes and road shoes and i I used to work there selling shoes um and it's it's just a great running area great community uh and i they've changed the course since i did it last time so i don't know exactly where it goes but there were quite a few stairs there's quite a few like concrete stairs we have to hike up like steep areas but just yeah, amazing views of all these like waterfalls and good forest running trails. Um, Ithaca does get a little humid sometimes in the summer, but yeah, it's it's organized really well. He's got like these cool prizes where like anyone could win them. Uh, you just like you might win like a home baked berry pie or something, or you get random bonuses for doing random things during the race. He always keeps it fun, so it's a it's a great event, and I'd, I'd recommend it. And, you know, Ithaca's a really fun place to be, especially in the summer. Uh, it's like a trail running heaven, and there's great beer there. There's great food there. Great people there. Uh, really cool, hip college town. So, uh, gosh, I, I love it there. It makes me nostalgic to go back. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, it it all the pictures and some video makes it, it just look incredible. Uh, so yeah, it's on. That's one of those things. Adding it to the bucket list. Got to do it. Uh, Sage, thanks, man. Thanks for taking the time out of your night. Um, I hope Sandy's okay with you taking the hour plus uh, away from dinner plans or you know whatever you guys got going on tonight. But I really appreciate you tuning in and joining us tonight on the show, man. And we can't, we can't wait to have you back on because you're always such a fantastic guest, honest and, and completely uh, uh, you're forthcoming with a lot of your training and your tips and people just absolutely love it. So thank you, man. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. It's, it's always a huge honor and you're doing such great work with the channel. It's just, it's been great to follow and uh, gosh, your films are just so inspiring and amazing. And uh, it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun to see that creativity applied to the trail running scene and to see those, those visuals come out. And uh, I know it's really hard work to make videos. I'm an amateur, but I get inspired when I see your, your video work. So keep up the great work. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great community to be a part of. So thanks fun. man. Yeah, I could geek out with film stuff with you, I know, for a long time because you know how much work goes into it because um, you do all of your own stuff too. So those of you who are still watching live or watching in the archive version or even listening on the podcast, go subscribe to his channel. Go uh, support him on Patreon. Go uh, follow him on Instagram and Twitter and social media. You guys know the drill and thank him for joining us tonight. We'll see you guys next Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for more Ginger Runner Live, episode number 105. Very excited for next week. Uh, but in the meantime, get out there, train hard, race harder, and party the hardest. See you guys next week. That's it. Good night.